my advice is to take risks because I think what you will find is that it's not nearly as perilous to engage the feminine attributes that that you leave at the door when you step into the corporate board meeting. Welcome to the Well Woman Show, the only podcast that supports you to use mindfulness, feminism, leadership, and strategy so you can be healthy and connect deeply with the people you love while making money and changing the world. And now here's your host, London School of Economics grad, feminist thought leader, red chili enthusiast, mom and work-life integration coach, Giovanna Rossi. Hello, hello, Well Women. It is uh, August already. I can't believe it. If you're listening to the show as we go live here, it's, uh, it's our we're well into the third quarter of the year. So for many of us, that means getting ready for kids to go back to school, uh, depending on where you are in the world you know, it might be summer or winter for you. So where I am, it's really, really hot still. And uh, I'm enjoying the last few days with the kiddos before they head back to school. And I'm super excited about our new and improved intro. Um, we re-recorded uh, to really kind of hone in on what we actually do on the show, which is to support you to be healthy and really connect with the people you love while pursuing your uh, dreams in terms of what you want to, you know, do in the world and um, how you want to change the world. And so that ties right in with our guest today, who talks about empowerment to step up in response to the cries of the world to find your invitation to be of service. And uh, so I'm super excited to introduce Mirabai Starr, an award-winning author of creative nonfiction and contemporary translations of sacred literature. She and I talk about your connection to the rising of women's voices and women's wisdom, whether you're female, male, or any gender, and also this idea that you're empowering yourself to find your invitation to be of service. So I love this conversation, super powerful. Uh, you can find all the information and links today at wellwomanlife.com slash 173 show. And you can also continue the conversation with us in the Well Woman Life community group at wellwomanlife.com slash Facebook. The Well Woman Show is thankful for support from Natural Awakenings Magazine in New Mexico and High Desert Yoga in Albuquerque. Now to my interview with Mirabai Star. Mirabai, I want to start by having you share with our listeners, what are you working on and how does it impact women's lives and well-being? Well, I have spent most of my adult life involved with and deeply engaged with actually the teachings of the mystics across the spiritual traditions. And by the mystics, I mean, you know, those ecstatics that are often poets like Rumi or like my namesake, Mirabai, and other poets that we know of. Some are just contemporary American poets like the late, great Mary Oliver who write in this way that that not only shows their deep engagement with all that is, but also kind of evokes a mystical state in us. And by a mystic, I mean someone who has a direct experience of the sacred, independent of any particular religious ideology or belief system or dogma or even rituals. But that's felt sense of connectedness with the unity of the, the universe, right? That we feel when you have a mystical moment, it's like you experience a melting of your individuality into the, the boundlessness of, of the one. And it's often a, an experience of love, of great love. So a mystic is one who joins with the beloved, the great beloved, the beloved with a beat. So I've been, you know, looking at the, the mystics in all the spiritual and religious traditions of the world for many years and teaching at, at the University of New Mexico in Taos um, about the mystics. But I became very interested in the last few years about women mystics in particular. I have translated uh, Teresa of Avila, and who was a 16th century Spanish mystic, I'm fluent in Spanish, and also Julian of Norwich from Middle English. She was a contemporary of Chaucer and the first woman to write in English. What I found is that when I started investigating these, these mystics across the world's religions, it was 
was hard to find. They, they've been really buried, very successfully <laughs> buried these wisdom jewels of, of, from the feminine by the patriarchy. And so it was kind of an excavation process, like a spiritual archaeology expedition to try to find them. And so I've been gathering those wisdom jewels across the spiritual traditions that really uplift uh, feminine wisdom and feminine voices. Oh, there's so much there to to dig into. And I want to ask you a few things about what you've just said. First of all, when you talk about the sacred and, and about mystics, I know your work is, as you said, sort of excav- excavating well-known or, or documented mystics. But do you think that everyone has the potential of being a mystic? Yes, absolutely. And that's the theme of my new book, Wild Mercy, that we are all mystics if we have ever had even a glimpse of our essential interconnectedness with all that is. If we have ever experienced those beautiful melting moments while gazing at a sunset or witnessing the birth of a child or the death of a loved one in moments of passionate sexuality. This is our birthright, is to experience our oneness with the, with the one, the melding of lover and, and beloved, of our souls with the divine. And it doesn't have to be in a religious context in order to qualify as a mystical experience. It's, a, it's an experience of oneness and an experience Experience of great love. And I think why? we've all had them and we all will have them. And why is it so important to have these moments or this experience? In addition to the fact that I feel it's our birthright and we and and it's a, a great um, joy and privilege to claim it, I think that in this divisive world that seems to be rooted in these false um, models and structures that separate and divide us and set us against the other experiences of interconnectedness of our essential interbeing with all that is are the antidote to those impulses that we are conditioned to follow that separate us from each other, that make other groups of people um, dangerous and somehow less than human. And when we allow ourselves to kind of dissolve that separate sense of self, that illusion of separation, then we can't help but actually, but really respond not only to the other, but to the suffering that it can't help but perceive in the world. And and then we can't help but but rise to the call to the cries of the world and see what we can do to help alleviate suffering in this world because we experience in a felt sense our interconnectedness with all beings and all the phobias Islamophobia and racism and and sexism and all of those isms begin to fall away. I love that you call it an antidote we need an antidote (laughs) yeah because it's a poison it's a it's a poison all those isms and so in your book your new book wild mercy living the fierce and tender wisdom of the women mystics do you help people find the mysticism for themselves and then use it I definitely do. The way that the book is structured is that all the chapters, each of the 12 chapters is focused on a particular theme that is just a part of our everyday lives, like creativity, um, stewardship of the earth, cultivating a meditation practice, uh, cultivating a Sabbath, sexuality, parenting, uh, death and dying and grief and grieving, forgiveness. These are all realities that all of us have to navigate navigate in the landscape of the human experience, right? And so what I do in each chapter is that I draw on wisdom teachings from women mystics, but also from archetypal wisdom beings, goddesses, and so on. And then I also talk about some of my own personal experiences. I'm very vulnerable and transparent with my own um, path. I don't present myself as some kind of guru who's gained, you know, perfect awakening, but as, as a woman who's trying to walk through this world awake and to awaken, to wake up and, and to be a service, to wake up and step up. And that's what I'm inviting everyone to do along with me. I also give examples of contemporary women who are often well-known spiritual teachers, but sometimes unknown women who are exemplars, who I feel are really luminaries that, that light the way for all of us. 
And then finally, at the end of each chapter, I offer a very practical exercise for people to engage in to connect with their own mystical soul, the soul of the feminine mystic, which is kind of a different creature (laughs) than the masculine mystic. But as you say, Giovanna, this is a book that is for everyone, for people, what what I call people of all genders who are thirsty for feminine wisdom and ready for the voice of the feminine. And when you talk about the feminine, uh, I just want to clarify this because I think this is a, an interesting point that often get becomes confused. We're not just talking about women. We're talking about the feminine in all of us. That's exactly right. So we're talking about the feminine in all of us, which dwells or abides in the most manly man. <laughs> I Like I think of my husband, who who is a very masculine man and does all of those things and, and has all of those qualities that we associate often with men, in, at least in Western culture. And yet he is deep. He has this deep feminine soul that is nurturing and tender and spontaneous and all of those kind of attributes of, of the feminine feminine that I feel and that many of us feel are missing from the prevailing culture and need to be reclaimed. And so men are as as, uh, hungry for this as women are, and men are as, as badly oppressed by the patriarchal structures we've all inherited in in religion and and politics and everywhere. These are teachings, feminine wisdom teachings that belong to all of us and that everyone I know is kind of longing for, whether they realize it or not. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a special need for men, and and frankly, all of us, uh, to feel comfortable and okay with, to Mm -hmm. unlearn a lot of the systems and and to embrace uh, the feminine within all of us. It's more, it seems more logical and straightforward for women to embrace the feminine, but actually more and more men are seeking it out and really embracing that. That's It's absolutely true. And also people who are transgendered or non-gender binary are really finding themselves in this book because I really made an effort to be as inclusive as possible. But it's interesting that you talk about the masculine and feminine in, in men and in women because I I think that w- many women, in order to succeed in the prevailing culture, have adopted a lot of masculine qualities that have ended up not only not serving them, but backfiring in many ways. So that women in in positions of leadership are often recapitulating the very structures that have historically oppressed us. Yeah. Step into leadership with our whole being, true to who who we are. Right, and I think that's a, a real challenge when we are trying to to do that, but we're operating within a structure or a system that is not that right. That is still very much set in patriarchy and masculine leadership. And so do you have any advice for listeners who are who are really trying to embody and and bring more of the feminine, but are operating within a structure that's that's not supportive? Yes, my advice is to take risks. Because I think what you will find is that it's not nearly as perilous to engage the feminine attributes that you leave at the door when you step into the corporate board meeting, for instance, as you may think. For instance, vulnerability being, and that doesn't mean you have to burst into tears at a meeting, but to be transparent and vulnerable and connected to your holy emotional body and your physical body. I mean, I think that's another thing that we're conditioned to leave behind is is our bodies. Is it, The feminine is so much about embodiment and the holiness and beauty and, of the body that we're not just these minds and intellect, but we are embodied beings. So to bring the body and the feelings and the emotions and also ambiguity, to be willing to abide in liminal spaces where we don't always have the answers, to be willing to not know and to invite other people to not know, and therefore to enter into this vibrant creative field where the answers become um, this organic and collective emergent uh, reality. And and that is a risk that does defy the norms that we have inherited. But it's uh, often what people find is when they take the risk to model 
those attributes of vulnerability and tenderness and wild creativity and inclusivity. The people around us uh, respond with relief and and then in kind. So I think it's a risk well worth taking. I love your explanation because I I find myself in those situations a lot. Every job or career decision I've made, I've been sort of in that. And then I think a lot of listeners too uh, struggle with that. So that's really good advice. So I want to ask you, you know, a lot of spiritual teachers really separate sort of spirituality from activism. And, and I don't, I don't hear you doing that at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. How are your teachings supporting people to be active and, and take a stand and for the good of our world? Thank you so much for recognizing that. I think that that's essential to my work. I mean, that's like the essence of my work is the confluence of spirituality and activism or sacred activism or cultivating the inner life and then bringing the fruits of that endeavor to feed the hungry world in a way. And for me, and I think for many of us, there is no meaningful separation between a contemplative life or spiritual life and service in the world. It's it's a seamless whole. And I think that also is, is a very feminine reality that when we, as I said earlier, uh, it, allow ourselves to turn inward and tune into the reality of our interbeing with all that is, our inter the the interconnectedness of all reality and um, of all uh, our connection with all created things. Um, then we cannot help but respond to the cries of the world to see what we can do to help. So that when we have a meditation practice, for instance, it's not an isolated experience of sitting on the cushion in order to have our own little private. Uh, liberation or salvation. It's about allowing ourselves to take our rightful place in the web of creation. And then after having sat in the stillness and allowed ourselves to, to be fully present, then we enter back into our lives and, uh, and we look through those eyes of love that we have experienced by virtue of our of our prayer life or our meditation experience and by looking through the eyes of love we see um, that interconnectedness and then we respond so there are many people who are doing this work and 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 there are some men too like Andrew Harvey or Father Richard Rohr right there in Albuquerque New Mexico with the Center of Action and Contemplation but women just kind of know it in our in the cells of our bodies that our spiritual lives are are just by their very nature integrated with service. Mirabai, one more question uh, before we go to the segment called Superpowers for Success that we always end with. Um, I just want to reflect on this idea that many Western and or white bull or women have told, you know, sort of taken it upon themselves to tell the stories of others, other people in other cultures. And some people define that as cultural appropriation and other other kinds of things that we can talk about. Where are you in that? Like, I know you have done this spiritual archaeology, you know, as you call it, project. So how do you see yourself in that conversation? And, and how do you respond to perhaps criticism. Well, I am passionately engaged in that conversation because I am someone who has spent, as I said, my entire adult life um, gathering the elixir from the heart of all the world's great spiritual traditions and sharing them with others. And it was in the process of writing this book, Wild Mercy, Giovanna, that I really came to terms with cultural appropriation in myself. I was able to notice it in other people pretty well, but I I was pretty blind to the ways in which I might have been doing that because I thought I was doing so very respectfully by always attributing all of those uh, wisdom jewels from other traditions to the cultures to which they belonged. Moreover, I was raised in the counterculture of the 1970s in Taos, New Mexico, where I was exposed 
to all of these different spiritual traditions. And I had teachers from the time I was a child who were Buddhist and Hindu and Sufi and across the spiritual landscape. And I had deep teachings as a teenager. So I felt that these traditions were mine, that they, that I belong to them and they belong to me. But I, I had a kind of rude awakening a couple of years ago where I really had to come to grips with the fact that I can't just help myself to the goodies of all these other cultures as if they belong to me, it's particularly when white people, which is my demographic, have colonized these other cultures. And I am not allowed to benefit from their resources at their at their expense. So mm-hmm. let me just say that that's a work in progress and that I bring this up in all of my workshops and retreats and keynote talks of which I have many <laughs> these days, many more and more and I'm really trying to just raise the question because that's what the feminine does. We live in the questions. The liminal spaces are sacred spaces and I'm willing to not know but to keep asking and to ask publicly. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with Mirabai Star and Superpowers for Success. I'm so thankful for support from Natural Awakenings Magazine in New Mexico, a monthly green healthy lifestyle publication. And for support from High Desert Yoga, promoting optimum physical health, clarity of mind and spiritual inspiration for all. Whether you're just starting your journey or you've been on it for months or even years, the Well Woman Jumpstart is a great place to begin. You might want to know, what's the outcome? How will I benefit from this? If you want to reach the income, impact, or intimacy goals you have, you can jump right in with this awesome jumpstart. You'll learn what your unique superpower is, which is super important for everything else you'll be working on in your life. You'll learn proven tools to address your particular challenge. You'll get real clarity about your life and your big goals and challenges. And you'll get to talk to me, Giovanna, one-on-one, and I'll give you feedback and insight specifically on your goal or challenge. If you're ready to jump in, go to wellwomanlife.com slash jumpstart. Mirabai, we're back with Superpowers for Success. I want to ask you a few quick questions that really help kind of relay your life experience to listeners with the hopes that it will somehow help our listeners on their path. So what does success in life mean for you? Having loving relationships with everyone in my sphere and with all of creation. And love by loving relationships, I don't always mean that everything's always easy and sweet, but they're authentic, engaged, caring relationships in which I'm willing to not be the most important person in the room. Okay. When did you know you were really good at what you do? Well, I'm a writer and I started writing as soon as I could write. And I could tell by the responses that this was this was a gift that I had. And I've always had a lot of encouragement to cultivate that gift. I always felt such joy, not only because of the affirmation I received, but in the writing process, in the creative process, and especially in the part where I didn't know what was going to happen next, I've always experienced this surge of aliveness and, and joy. So I think that at what is ours to do is supposed to feel wonderful. I love that because many, many women that I interview answer that question uh, solely based on external validation. But the way you articulated that internal is so... So powerful. Thank you, Giovanna. So that that is wonderful. And we will definitely share that with listeners. Um, and then the next question I have is, can you describe a personal habit that contributes to your well being? Uh, walking in nature. <clears throat> I have the great gift of living on the, the edge of National Forest here in Taos. And so and I have two wonderful dogs. And so every single day, no matter what the weather, and it gets really cold and snowy here, um, I walk out outdoors and connect with Mother Earth. I don't bring my devices. Well, I have a cell phone in case something happens, but I don't look at it. And I really try to just be fully present in the natural world every single day. And that um, that is the, the thing that probably sustains me the most. Okay. And do you do that at at the same time every day or for the same amount of time? Or is it just sort of like, as long as you do it, it, it's, that's good. Yeah. I don't have a a schedule. I don't have a writing schedule either. I just 
kind of get up and go, especially because I'm sitting on my butt at my desk a lot. So <laughs> just okay. move body. Um, Mirabai, what superpower did you discover you had only to realize it was there all the time? Oh, oh gosh. Um, uh, um, the ab- Oh, here's one. The ability to create community that when I gather people, uh, they connect with each other and I can just disappear. And, um, and that's been a, a really strongly emerging aspect of my work with women. But it, when I look back, I've always, I've always had that kind of impulse. Okay. And what advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, <clears throat> um, that I'm not fat. <laughs> that was like, a, you know, this obsession with my weight and my body and I, you know, and I'm, I'm four feet, 11 inches. And if I go up above 105 pounds, I freak, you know, I freak out. So it would be, please don't worry about that. And I'm Jewish and I have a big, beautiful Jewish nose and all of those aspects of embodiment that I have critiqued uh, my whole life to just let it go and embrace the beauty of my exact, um, created form I think be one of the things that I would go back and and do because it's it's created suffering that was so unnecessary so when did you start listening to that advice (laughs) once it would you know it's so funny it's like um youth is wasted on the young it was it was in my 40s probably but you know when it was Giovanna I I don't want to break people's hearts here at the very end of our time together but it was when my 40s her old daughter Jenny was killed in a car accident when I was 40. And it was a, such a wake up about what matters and what doesn't matter. And I think that that's when a lot of that obsession with, with body image fell away. And I don't want to, to suggest that people need a tragedy or a catastrophe right. in order to wake up to <clears throat> their own beauty and what really matters. But it was it was a wake up call for me around around that. Oh my gosh! Well, you have broken all of our hearts, and so love to you. Um, and I also want to just pick up on what you said, which is that a lot of a lot of what I do in my work and the Well Woman Show and the community is is about you know tools and information and embodying all of this so that we don't have to have a big tragedy in order to in order to be living you know and living in the way that we want to be living yes good how beautiful bless you in that endeavor okay so just a couple last questions for you um do you identify as a feminist yes in fact um some reviewer recently i think it was publishers weekly um called my work spiritual feminism and I think they coined that term, and I love it. And I, I, I'll take it. I'm a spiritual feminist. Ooh, I love it. I talk about in my work being doing uh, using mindfulness and feminism. So spiritual feminist, I love it. Okay, what are you reading right now, Mirabai? Oh, um, right now I am reading Elaine Pagel's memoir. Elaine Pagel's is, of course, the person who translated the Gnostic Gospels. And I forgot, I think her book, I think the book is called Why Religion? And it is fantastic. In fact, it's it's the very quintessence of what I'm talking about with, with engaging these feminine attributes. She is both scholarly and personal. She is both teaching us something but also being really authentic and and personal and revealing her own human heart. And that combination to me is is very exciting and I think carries the seeds of what we need to, to heal this world. I love that. Okay, and final question for you. You're a leader. I, I interview leaders in all different areas on this show. What is your greatest challenge as a leader right now? It's being challenged by privileged white men who are trying to explain to me why I'm wrong, why either God has no gender and therefore I should not be contributing to dualism by talking about the feminine. That's a popular one. Topic of mansplaining right there. And another thing that they're, they're 
that they're objecting to is they feel that I am um, dissing men or I'm picking on men and especially privileged white men. And they get very defensive about that. You know, I have to navigate that one. Well, mindfully, I'm neither coddling them nor am I defending myself, but that I'm really engaging them and inviting them to reconsider their own participation in these patriarchal structures. What a great way to end the show. Mirabai, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you so much, Giovanna. I'm really honored to be with you all. That's it for our show today. Remember, if you need support to live your well woman life, head over to wellwomanlife.com slash Facebook to join us. Our monthly live event, Well Women Drinks, brings women together to share our successes and challenges as women, leaders, moms, aunts, sisters, and all the other roles we carry. If you'd like to attend a Well Women Drinks near you, or if there isn't one in your city yet and you'd like to start one, email info at wellwomanlife.com. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and subscribe in iTunes and leave a review. This helps raise visibility, which is super helpful when it comes to producing the show every week. For feedback, comments, or just to let me know you are listening, today, find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Well Woman Life. I'm Giovanna Rossi for The Well Woman Show. Until next time, have a super powerful week.